For more on 19th century banking and monetary debates, let's now consider Peel's Act of 1844 and the Currency School. This act, of course, has to do with regulating the Bank of England. Formerly, Peel's Act was called the Bank Charter Act of 1844, and just as an introductory overview, it did the following. First, it tried to centralize exclusive note-issuing powers in the Bank of England. Second, it stipulated 100% gold reserves for new notes above a certain level. It treated more generally banking and control of the currency as separate functions. It also stipulated de facto that the Bank of England would contract credit in case of a drain. That's what the act actually meant in practice. And it tried to create what was then called a self-regulating monetary order. That's all quite a mouthful. A lot of it will become clearer as we go back and revisit the context. For historical background, recall that in 1821, England returns to the gold standard. We explain this in more detail in our videos on the bullionist debates. But in the years 1821 to 1844, there is a recurring problem, and this recurring problem is that of drains of gold on the Bank of England. Individuals at these times wanted to convert their banknotes into actual gold holdings, yet the Bank of England didn't actually own that much gold, thus problems periodically arose. Over what was no more than a 23-year period, this problem of gold drains actually arose three separate times. The typical problem would be that a gold drain would go on for months, the Bank of England would be in danger of losing too much gold, and finally the bank would raise interest rates to bring deposits back into the bank, but that would have a contractionary effect on the economy as a whole. But of course, to the extent you have an ongoing drain of gold under a gold standard, the central bank either has to raise interest rates or break the link to gold and thus go back to a paper currency. Into this environment now enter the so-called currency school. The currency school understood full well that something was wrong, but not all of their recommendations actually were correctly addressing the actual problems. But in any case, members of the currency school typically believed these following propositions. First, they thought that legal convertibility of banknotes into gold was not enough to prevent England's problems, and in particular the problems of an overissue of banknotes. Second, their overall vision was that money, paper money, this mixed system of currency and deposits, overall you wanted to try to make that behave like a pure metallic currency, as if everyone were simply sending around pieces of gold. Finally, currency school members believed in what we would now call better capitalized banks. Overall, I think of this as pretty much a tight money view, and it wanted to live with the drains of gold by actually allowing deflationary pressures in the economy, but it would resist those pressures by having better capitalized banks. The most influential writers in the currency school tradition were Lord Overstone, Robert Torrens, and G.W. Norman, Norman working for the Bank of England itself. The currency school in general also wanted to limit or abolish the note issue of country banks and thus really have a rule-based centralized control over how much money would be created. And the Bank Charter Act of 1844 absolutely did contribute toward this end. In any case, Peel's Act or the Bank Charter Act, it does pass in 1844 almost unanimously. There's no serious opposition. And just to recap, the main thing it did was it said that new note issues would have to be backed by gold by 100%. Again, this was a tight money point of view. It was, in essence, limiting the ability of the Bank of England to act as lender of last resort, and it was saying, we're going to tolerate these deflationary pressures. On the other side of the debate was a diverse group of economists, sometimes called the Banking School, and the best-known economists here are Took and Fullerton, and also James Wilson of the magazine The Economist and J.W. Gilbert. I wouldn't quite say that the banking school had a unified vision on all matters, but there were some common elements. In general, they tended to deny that banknotes were something special. They thought that simply controlling banknotes or linking banknotes to gold 
wasn't really solving or addressing economic problems, and instead they tended to focus on overall credit rather than money per se, including commercial credit. They also had a better understanding of what they called hoards, which we might now call monetary velocity, than did the currency school. So the banking school often thought that changes in monetary velocity were important for economic conditions, whereas the currency school was more focused on the supply of banknotes per se. And rather than obsessing about laws for the control of the money supply or banknotes, members of the banking school tended to focus on the endogeneity of money, that is stressing that economic conditions come first and the endogeneity of money would follow from those. In all of these regards, members of the banking school were in numerous regards more modern than, say, members of the currency school. That said, I think it would be incorrect to simply side with the banking school in these debates. Very often the banking school didn't have coherent policy positions and sometimes didn't even have coherent theoretical claims. I read the banking school as having at least two different strands. One of those is what I would call the free banking vision or version of the banking school, and that's been outlined by economist Lawrence White. And these individuals thought the key was to have some notion of laissez-faire in the issue of currency, and that with free entry into banking and convertibility, you would have the supply of money expand when the demand for money went up. Another version of the banking school is something sometimes called the banking principle, and that was the idea that the supply of money should expand to meet the so-called needs of trade. But again, if you read the writings of the banking school advocates, this is not always a well-defined notion. What exactly are the needs of trade? They never presented a marginalist understanding of the needs of trade being more or less, but it was just this amorphous concept of the needs of trade, how much money does an economy need? That all said, there's still this big difference between the banking school and the currency school, and that the banking school overall wanted an expansionary monetary policy one way or another in the case of a drain of gold reserves. Anyway, how did Peel's Act or the Bank Charter Act work out? Well, I think actually not so great. Over the next 20 years, gold convertibility, and indeed the act itself, is suspended three separate times in these years. The external pressures draining gold out of the Bank of England were simply too great, and it was necessary to return, if only temporarily, to a system of paper money with no convertibility. That may have been the better thing to do, but still it can be argued it was a sign that the underlying gold standard was in some ways failing. By the way, for a good look at the crisis of 1847, you might want to read this very good article by Dornbush and Frankel. You might wonder, well, could a pure paper currency have been used by the Bank of England simply all the time? It's hard to say. Looking back, note that during the 19th century, there were very few economic data collected, so you can't imagine there being an art or practice of central banking comparable to the 20th or 21st centuries. And furthermore, back then, capital markets were much less poorly informed, and it was easier for governments to get away with irresponsible inflation than it is today. So, in other words, you can at least make the argument that a general gold standard, but with periodic temporary suspensions of convertibility, maybe it wasn't the absolute best they could have done, but it's actually harder to think of a very clear improvement on a lot of the monetary institutions of 19th century Britain, given all of the constraints that were being faced. This is a complex topic, but there are some very good readings available. If you have access to JSTOR, there's a very good two-part piece by Marion Daugherty called The Currency Banking Controversy. Maybe the best single source is Jacob Viner from his free and online book, Studies in the Theory of International Trade. Read the chapter on English Currency Controversies, 1825 to 1865. Online, there's a good piece by Humphrey and Kelleher about Peel's Act of 1844 and how it connects to the idea of a lender of last resort. The primary sources here are often quite confusing to read, the arguments don't always make sense, and sometimes the terminology is obscure or ill-defined, but there is a good volume, uh, not online, which collects a lot of the key documents and pamphlets, and that's by T.E. Gregory, and it selected select statutes and also documents relating to British banking. In any case, maybe the overall lesson here is that tight money versus easy money positions really have a very long history in monetary debates.